I want to, I want to do uh, with you all right now is I want you to do something for me. If you do have your Exodus journals, um, I want you to open up to the back of them. Try to find three blank pages if you have any pages left. And all I want you to do is I want you to write each of these questions I'm about to have at the top of each of those pages. And then throughout this week, if you get some time in your own to personal time with the Lord, just reflect on those and, and, and answer those questions uh, as, uh, as you uh, see fit. Uh, but the three questions that I want you to write up the, on the top of the first blank page is, uh, what did Exodus teach me about God? Take a second, write that down. What did Exodus teach me about God? Uh, the second question would be, what did Exodus teach me about discipleship slash following Jesus? In which ways did uh, you learn about the importance of obedience to the Lord? All those sorts of things. Take the time to write that down. And the last is, what did Exodus teach me about myself? Uh, what did I learn about what it means to follow God in my own personal and everyday life? And uh, and what are things that uh, I was challenged by and convicted by. So spend some time uh, this week reflecting on those, answering those, and then we actually want to send out an email to you. It, it's not a requirement or anything like that, um, but just a, uh, uh, an opportunity that if you want to respond to that email that has the same three questions, we'd just love to hear uh, what the Lord did in your heart and your mind. So here is what I want to do in order to finish up our Exodus series, all right? I want to give us a, a brief Exodus recap as we look about at the person of God as we see him in the book of Exodus. Then I want to ask a question, and then I want to look at two important things uh, as we look at the final five verses of the book of Exodus. So first for us is a quick recap. And so uh, I want to use the question, uh, the first question that I, I gave you all, is what does Exodus teach us about God? Because back in the opening chapters of Exodus, we see that Israel is in slavery, and, and God hears the cries of his people, uh, and he sets out to bring them back into his presence. So they're in a strange land with strange gods, and they know uh, these stories and this heritage of this past of who Yahweh is, but they, as a people, they feel distant from uh, Yahweh, and it was his goal to remedy that. So God wanted to reposition himself in the life of his people, to take up residence among them, uh, to make them a people who behold their God because they have a God who beholds them. And so uh, open up in your uh, Bibles or Exodus journals to Exodus chapter 40. Now, we're not going to go through verses 1 through 33, but I'll just summarize them real quick. And when you look at verses 1 through 33, uh, this big lead up for the last several chapters is all this instruction around the tabernacle. But then eventually, uh, Moses in chapter uh, 40, verses 1 through 33, constructs the tabernacle, which is the primary location where the presence of God would dwell. But let me read to you verses 34 through 38 as a part of our recap, and then we'll come back here in a little bit uh, to unpack this. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled their tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till, it, till the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by uh, night, and in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journey. So, as with all scripture, we learn about who God is. And there are many things that we could say about who God is throughout, as we look at the book of Exodus, but for the sake of time, I just want to briefly focus on a couple the first thing that I want to look at in our recap is that our God is a promise-keeping God. You see, in Exodus chapter 40, we see the cloud moving from where it was on the mountaintop down to where the people are in the tabernacle. And this tells us something powerful about the promises of the Lord. You've got to remember that think about where the Israelites once were and now see how far it is that they have come. They were once crying out to God in the midst of slavery, and now they are beholding the glory of that same God who heard their cries. 
They were shackled by the Egyptians, but now in freedom, they look upon his majesty in the middle of their camp. They were a people who felt distant from Yahweh, but now they are those who cannot deny his presence. And none of this was their own doing. It was the steadfast love and promise keeping of God that brought them here. Think about the promise that God made uh, to Moses. Eventually, he said it to Pharaoh. He says, let my, tell Pharaoh this, let my people go so that they may worship me on this mountain. Did God not get them to the mountain? He did. Because they were in the middle of it. They were in difficulty. They were in circumstances that we can't imagine. And yet God still came through for them. And I know that there are those of us in this room as a people that you're in the middle of it right now. You're going through circumstances that we can't understand. God got those people out of Egypt. Why? Because he's a promise-keeping God, and we are sure that he is going to keep his promises to you as well. Another thing that Exodus teaches us is that our God is an ever-present God. When was God with them? He was with them in the silence and the Red Sea, in the slavery and the freedom, in the certainty and the doubt, in the praise and in the complaining and in the suffering and the prosperity. You see, people tend to think that when uh, all is going well and when God is blessing us, he is present but when there is tension and tragedy or suffering people think that god is absent that is not the god we find in exodus we find a god who hears the cries of his people and he acts and lastly for our recap like i said there's so much more but for the sake of time but lastly for our recap we learn that god is a powerful god who uses powerless people. You see, in Exodus, he uh, employs an unlikely person to lead the people out, a person who was in hiding, a person who was a murderer, a person who was weak in speech, someone who was hesitant to go. But God guided the life of Moses from infancy to adulthood and preserved him for God's purposes to do one of the most vital things in the history of God's people. And if God can do that with Moses, every single person in this room is qualified for the next God-oriented mission that he assigns you to. But you may be thinking, but I'm not qualified. God knows that. He just doesn't care. He wants to show you how he can use you in spite of you, for his good purposes in this world. But will you, like Moses, say yes to the task? And I know there are some of you here this morning that God is calling to do uh, big and wonderful things for his name, but you feel so unworthy and unqualified, and you feel those things based on the world standards. Stop looking at the world standards. Look at God's standards. And look to God. He is able when we are unable. He is powerful when we are powerless. Look, he didn't look at Moses through the lens of a runaway shepherd hiding away in Midian. No, God saw him through the lens of the one who would lead the people out of Egypt. God does not see you through a lens of your uh, alcoholism, your porn addiction, your insecurity, your idolatry of success, your lack of self-control. God wants us to repent of those things, yes, and turn to him and say yes to him, and he uses us for his good purpose, but he sees you through the lens of someone of who you can become under his great power, despite our powerlessness. But we have to ask the question, can we admit our powerlessness? so that his power may work through our weakness. So that's a brief recap. Feels like we could end the sermon right there, but we have more to talk about here this morning, which leads me to want to focus on the remainder of our time here this morning and what I want to highlight from the final five verses from the book of Exodus. So I want to start by asking us the question, and then I want to unpack two things for us. And the question I want to ask is this. 
If God is supposed to be at the center of our lives, where are you in proximity to him? Think about that for a second. If God is supposed to be at the very center of our lives, where we revolve around him as individuals, as a church, where are you and where are we in proximity to him? Because from these verses, we are going to look at two things. The first is, is where God places himself. And the second is where God's people ought to place themselves. Let's look down at verses 34 and 35. We're going to start by where God places himself. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, I want to... I want us to understand that there is great significance not only in what is happening, that the glory of the Lord is there, but where it is happening. Because when you look at all of the other texts and you see the descriptions of how God wants them to set up the camp, we, we see something very particular about where the tabernacle is located. The presence of God is at the center of his people. Take a look at this photo. And this shows you, this is how God instructed the Israelites to set up their camp when they're at rest, is that right there in the middle, uh, God is at the center, and the 12 tribes uh, are right around them, all at about equal distance uh, from him. And because the reason for that is because he is the God at the center. And the significance comes, like I said already this morning, is that when we understand where God was prior to this, he was on the mountain but he moves from the mountain to be in the midst of his people. And this is so significant in terms of how God relates to his people. We've talked about it plenty of times throughout this series that uh, the gods in those days, they were often distant and, and, and far away, and, and people did some crazy, desperate things in order for them to you know, try to get their gods to respond. You know, we think about even with the prophet Elijah and the, the prophets of Baal. Uh, they are you know, cutting themselves, trying to bleed in order to get uh, the, their God to respond, but he doesn't respond. And the reason why he doesn't respond is because he's not real. But Yahweh responds. Why does Yahweh respond? Because Yahweh is real and he is present with his people. But in this one single act of Yahweh moving from the mountain to the midst of the people, he tells them that he is not a God like those gods. He doesn't stay at a distance. He doesn't remain on a mountain where you have to work really hard to come up to him if you want to relate to him. Oh, no. Our God puts himself right in the middle of his people to guide them, to disciple them, to discipline them, to be ever present. One commentator said, just because the time must surely come for Israel to leave behind the holy Mount Sinai, that does not mean that Israel leaves behind the God of Sinai. And we've seen that throughout all of Exodus, that he is not just the God who goes ahead of us. He is not just the God who gets us there. He is not just the God who goes before us. He's so much more. Uh, And you know, what's interesting is that I know that there are some people uh, that come into maybe a church setting or maybe you've been into a cathedral before, some places what we would call you know, sacred spaces. Right? The, the way that they're structured and designed is to, to look a little bit more sacred and look a little bit more holy and so on and so forth. And I get that. And so some people end up coming into those places because they feel in those places God is more present. Though it is true that God is present with us here in the now, but let me just also say this to you is that when you leave the parking lot today, God is not at the sign just waving by to you (laughs) on the way out. Thanks for stopping by. Hope you have a great week. Maybe you'll be back next week. He doesn't do that. That's not the God that we serve. We have a God who goes with you. And where does he go with you, my brothers and sisters? He goes with you into work into traffic, into doctor's appointments, and into the unemployment office, into therapy sessions, and into the voting booth. He goes with you into the job you hate. He goes with you into the career you love, into difficult meetings, into the surgery room, into the funeral home, and into the principal's office, 
into the guidance counselor and into parenting, into messy marriages. He goes with you when you're walking on the beach or if you're on a mission trip. He goes with you into every year of your college career and he goes with you into seemingly hopeless situations. Why? Because he is a God who's at the center of his people. And he tells his people, I will not abandon you. And he shares that up here. But that promise that he made by placing himself as the central piece of his people. Think about how the Israelites cried out years earlier. But God's, God's goal was not just to rescue them and move on. He does not treat Israel like a cat stuck in a tree that got up there because of its own stupid sense. And you have to pull it out of the tree and you put it back down. No, and then you just leave the cat alone. No, he stays with his people. He wants to have a relationship with them. He says to Israel, you want me? You got me. I will rescue you to be with you. And he says the same thing to us. He rescued us from sin and death, not just to save us from condemnation, but to be with us, to have a relationship with us. And why does he do that? Because he's the same God of Exodus who longs to be at the center of our lives. Which leads me to my next point, is where his people ought to place themselves. Look at verses 36 through 38. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out. So the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle of the day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. See, if God is at the center, it is vital that his people be in orbit around him. You see, the people of Israel operate as those who move in such a way as though God is the center of their lives. Notice the summary that Moses gives here about what it was like to follow the presence of God during that day. He says they would travel, but only when God would move. If God did not move, they did not travel. And if God moved, they started moving. And you want to know what that would require from God's people? Patience. Patience. Because I'm convinced, I don't know about you, but one important component about having a life centered around the Lord is learning to wait upon the Lord. And some of you have a hard time with this one. God, when are you going to move? I just started praying for this yesterday. Come on. (laughs) But I also know that there are some of you that have been praying for God to move in a particular situation for years. And the frustration can set in. And the one thing that I can tell you is that God gets what God wants. God moves when God moves, and when he does, we move. Following the Lord means that there are times where we have to wait upon the Lord to move. And there are times when we try to make things happen, and we try to get what we want now, but for some reason, those plans keep being thwarted and frustrated. Why? Because God might be thwarting and frustrating your plans to move him when you are the one who has to wait for him to move. Because if he is at the center, we must move when he moves. God does not bend to our will. We bend to his. We must place ourselves under his timing, his movement, and his direction in our lives. One of the important components about following God is we must wait upon the Lord, and that is what the people of Israel had to do as well. And I want to look at another phrase in this passage. It says, in the sight of all the people. You know, what must have been really wonderful for them was that the people could come outside the camp and see the very presence of their God in the middle of their camp. Most of it at probably very equal distance. But one of the things that we've learned about the presence of God uh, throughout not only Exodus, but all the Bible, is that proximity matters. You see, Moses tries to go to enter the the, the tent of meeting And one of the things that commentators all say, it wasn't like Moses wasn't allowed to go in. It was a factor of the fact that he just couldn't because the glory of the Lord was so potent and powerful that he physically could not go into it. It's like if you're trying to pull hot chicken off of a grill or something like that or pull something hot out of the oven, 
You don't want to go in too far without being burned. That was the kind of experience that Moses had, that he had to be stand back because of the glory of the Lord. But, we, uh, but we've also seen that in people's faith when it, when it comes to being distant from him as well, that things can be cold for them. Now, since we're talking about the sun, the S-U-N, let's keep using that example. You know, in order for proper life to exist on this planet, do you understand how vital it is for us to be the right distance from the sun? Let me read to you this from NASA's website. It says, Earth is the only place in the universe that we know where life exists. Life exists on Earth because of many important factors. We have the perfect sized star to live next to. We are the perfect distance from the sun. It's not too hot or too cold, and we have liquid water. It says, imagine if Earth was in where Pluto was, the sun would be barely visible, about the size of a pea, and the Earth's oceans and, and, and much of its atmosphere would freeze. On the other hand, if Earth took Mercury's place, it would be too close to the sun, and, it, and the water would form a steam atmosphere quickly boiling off. So what they're trying to say here is that though the sun is present, it is very important that we are a particular proximity from it in order to have healthy, flourishing, and proper life. And I have seen that be so true in our relationship with God as well. Proximity matters. We have seen certain people throughout the Bible try to get very close to God only for them to get incinerated. And for them to be blown back by the presence of God, we've also seen the people who have drifted away from the Lord and we've seen their faith get cold. We need to stay near to God to the point where we can get close enough to feel him and know him, but we don't want to get too far away where it's too dangerous for us because it can make things cold. Do you feel cold in your relationship with the Lord right now? Come back to a healthy distance from the Lord. One of the things that I could tell you is, that, and I know this to be true, and you do as well, is that relationships are as good as proximity sometimes. All the relationships that we form now in our lives are because of those two factors, consistency and proximity. And what we see is that when Israel rebels against God in the years to come, what happens? They're in exile. They drift from the Lord. And though it's cold for them at times, God still plans to remain near them and fulfill his promises. You see, because for the nation of Israel, centrality was crucial. God's centrality to the nation of Israel was very crucial. But since then, God has moved from relating to Israel uh, to nation, uh, as a nation now to relating to the people in the global church. So God's instructions once were uh, towards a particular nation have now shifted to us as a body of believers all over the world. And as I was thinking about this the other day, I was thinking about well, you know, what it mean, means to be a Christian in America today. And you know, what's interesting is at this point in history uh, in our, of our country, we are facing uh, issues such as the removal of God from schools, government buildings, you know, public settings, places where God isn't as central anymore. Now, I'm not going to address those particular things this morning because that would, that would require a lot more stuff to get into, but sometimes I wonder if there's some more pressing places where God might be absent. You see, we can get caught up in the conversation of whether or not God is going to return to the central, uh, as a central figure in our country and culture, but I want to ask the question, is he even the center of our homes? Is he the center of our hearts? Is Christ the center of this church? Is he at the center of our marriages, our parenting? Do our decisions orbit around him? Does he show up in our work? Does our Christ-like character come through in the dark places that God has us in? I find it very easy for us to look at the world out there, the external world, and, and, and you know, chalk up all the problems that we have in our country and culture, which I do believe that there is a direct correlation between the two of the absence of God in those public places, and say that those are the only issues uh, that are out there, and they're the only problems in our society because we feel that our values are under attack. But my question actually is, uh, are we even living out those same values that we cling to in the immediate context that God has placed us in? the places where we actually have the most influence? Are we keeping Christ at the center? Does his word guide and shape our daily living? Fathers and mothers, are we teaching our children God's word? More importantly, are we showing them what it means to grow up in grace and truth? Someone once said that it's not just about raising our children in the church, but also in Christ. Young adults, teenagers, are we standing up for our convictions or are we caving to the culture? 
Is God a part of your life and a role that you play when you come in around uh, church and Christian folk? Or do you become a completely different person when you're with your friends? Or is your life in Christ, period, everywhere you go? For everyone, is Jesus at the center of our lives? Or do other objects draw us into their orbit? You see, the sun is the most powerful object in our universe because of its mass and its gravitational pull. But should you know, scientifically, should another object with a larger mass than us actually get closer to us, we would probably deorbit from the sun and start to orbit it, even if that object isn't as powerful as the sun. All it has to be is more powerful than us. And that is what we see what happens with the golden calf and the people of Israel. They built this image of God because that made them feel in closer proximity to their God, and they began to worship it. They began to serve it. So a question for all of us is, what are the things in our lives that draw us away from God? Pause for a moment and think about that. What do you put yourself in closer proximity to, do, uh, to than God to draw you away from his orbit? What needs to happen in order to return to life with God at the center? Who do you need to cut off? What do you need to remove? What do you need putting an end to? And how do you untangle from where you are to get back to God? We are meant to be heliocentric. We are meant to orbit around the Son of God, and that is where the Bible says we will find life. Let me begin to close with this. You know, what's interesting is that during our whole Exodus series, we have been doing, trying to do our best to show you how the New Testament and the Old Testament are connected to one another. That everything in the Old Testament is actually designed to point you to their ultimate realities in Jesus. We hope that we've done a great job of doing that and helping you see that. But what I find interesting is that in these last five verses is that wherever the tabernacle went, the people of God went. Look at verse, uh, look down at verse 36. It says, throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. Talked about this already. When he moved, they moved. Two quick things. The first is, Adam told us a couple weeks ago, uh, in the structure of the tabernacle being built, that the Greek translation uh, of Uh, John chapter 1, where it says, and Jesus dwelt among us, is actually, and he tabernacled among us. That the arrival of Jesus is the ultimate expression of God's presence among his people. Second, if you read any of the gospel accounts, what do you see the disciples and the crowds doing every single time that Jesus moved? They moved with him. There's places where we see it all over where it says, and the crowds followed him. And the disciples went with him. And when Jesus wasn't where they wanted him to be, they came to him and said, Jesus, where were you? People are looking for you, right? Do you see what's happening? The gospel writers are trying to show us that Jesus is the true tabernacle. That he is the glory of the Lord present among his people. And to follow him is to be at the center of life. But there's one thing that the Lord knows about Israel and knows about you and me that we are prone to dislodge from our orbit. But Jesus is not like the S-U-N sun, refusing to go get wayward planets. No, this sun, S-O-N, is different. This sun steps down from glory to dwell with us in the dirt. This sun, this sun returns to the top of a mountain, this time not to display glory, but to bear sin. This sun keeps his promise to be the ransom for the whole world. And this son becomes powerless in order to give us the power of God through salvation. And this is done to lead all people, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, all sinners to one of the most central moments of human history, the cross of Jesus Christ. And in this moment, love and justice converge upon the Lord Jesus Christ so that hopeless and helpless sinners can be brought back into relationship with God for God to become central in our lives again. Listen to these words from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ 
Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And this is what Exodus has taught us. That our God keeps his promises. Our God saves powerless sinners by a powerful hand. Our God is ever present with us. And our God is at the center of all things. And staying near to him is where we find life. Come back to the center. God longs to dwell with you.